Well, in this uh, session, we come to uh, message three uh, of this conference. Uh, in the last message, we covered the matter of uh, being watchful and to be ready. Uh, in light of the Lord's coming, we need to be prepared. And the first thing we need is we need to be watchful, watching and be on the alert. But uh, just to be watchful only is only one side, one step. We still need another another step. This is being covered here in this message three. On our preparation for the Lord's coming, the second part, being faithful in service in the Lord's commission and in his gifts. Uh, for, the, for our preparation for the Lord's coming, we need to take care of these two aspects of our Christian life. The first aspect is related to our need to be watchful, which is related to our condition of life before God. So we need to have uh, our life needs to be in the proper condition, not to be uh, filled with the things of the world, but to be filled with the Spirit of God, to allow the life of God to grow in us, to mature in us. We don't want to be found immature. We don't want to be found worldly. We want to be the proper persons. Uh, our life with the Lord is proper, is normal. We are filled not with the things of the world, not with, with ourselves, but filled with the Spirit. But don't forget, before the Lord, we have also another status. That is, not only we are uh, His, uh, uh, His member, His, uh, uh, His uh, virgins loving Him, we are also His slaves. So as slaves, uh, the Lord expects us to serve Him. And in this service, He expects some result from our service, some profit from our service. We need to be balanced uh, in these two aspects, even you know, in our uh, normal Christian life. We need to grow in the Lord to take care of our condition of life, we also need to serve the Lord to exercise the Lord's gift given to us. Uh, in the Bible, actually, in the New Testament, uh, we are shown these two matters are mentioned again and again together. Uh, you know, we read uh, from, especially in these two chapters in Matthew 24, 25, uh, particularly in Matthew 25, you have the the, the parable of the virgins uh, related to uh, the believer's condition of life, and then followed uh, by the parable of the slave, the servants, given the talents. Uh, uh, our condition of life, our growth in life, is not for itself. God does not want us just to be growing in life to be spiritual, to be pure, and so forth, uh, so that we can become a, a piece of crystal put on a pedestal to, for people to admire. No. Our growing in life, our mature in, maturity in life, is so that we can cooperate with the Lord for His service. So life is always for service. And our service should always be based on and filled with life, should be by life and in life. So if we can balance these two matters in our Christian life, we will do well. Unfortunately, with many Christians, they are either um, uh, from one extreme or the other extreme. They pay attention to pursue spirituality and uh, to 
uh, take care of their condition of life before God, but they neglect, they neglected their service. So they don't have many fruits to be brought to the Lord. So they have to give account to the Lord. But there are also Christians who, who are very zealous, very uh, active to work for the Lord, and they even can bring in results. They get a lot of people saved. They helped a lot of people to be edified, but they all in their natural life, all in their natural life, by their natural energy. So the Lord will not approve of their work. The Lord will tell them in one day, uh, at the time at the judgment seat, I never know you. I never knew you. You did so much in my name, but you never have been approved by me. You never have been close to me. So we need to consider these two matters together. And uh, so our, our love for the Lord, our pursuing, pursuing of the Lord to grow in life must result in our service, in our, uh, our work for the Lord. And in our work for the Lord, we must be filled with Him as our life, all right? and by life and in life. Uh, this message, uh, we are coming to see, we come to see the matter of our service needing to be faithful. We need to be faithful in service in two, in two areas. In firstly, in the Lord's commission. And secondly, in the matter of the gifts we received or He gave us. The Lord has, uh, uh, based on uh, uh, these two uh, portions uh, of Matthew 24 and also 25, we see first in chapter 24, there is the matter of the Lord's commissioning uh, the, His uh, slave to take care of His household. I'd like to read to you these verses in uh, Matthew 24, verse 45 to 51. It says, Who then is the faithful and prudent slave, whom the master has set over his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Truly I say to you that he will set him over all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master delays and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with the drunken. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know and will cut him asunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. In that place there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. So here in this uh, portion I just read, you see the master uh, 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 gave a charge, had a commission, gave a commission to his slave to take care of his household, to give them food at the proper time. This is very meaningful. Now, the first point of the outline says, Matthew 24, 45 to 51 reveals that we must be faithful in service in the Lord's commission to give God as food to the members of His household, that we may win Christ as our reward in the coming kingdom. We should not forget that the Lord did give us a commission. Even uh, in Matthew 28, 19, right? A, the great commission that many Christians know, uh, 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 that the Lord upon uh, his departure after his, uh, his, uh, his uh, death and resurrection, he charged the disciples to go, therefore, and disciples the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. That was a charge. That was a commission. The Lord did give a charge to all of us. And, uh, and to this charge, we have to be faithful, Right? Someone has given you a commission. You need to be faithful. You, need to, you will be accountable for that, right? Just like uh, 
at work, your boss charged you with this project, you have to finish this, you know, accomplish this task by such and such a time. Well, if when your time comes, you still have not get only half done, you know, then you are not faithful. You 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 are not uh, uh, taking taking uh, 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 heed to his commission faithfully. Then you will be disciplined for that. So we should not forget that the Lord has given a commission to all of us that we need to take heed. We need to be uh, uh, feel accountable. He says, God has a household and a household administration and economy to dispense himself as food to the members of his household for his expression. It is uh, very interesting in this portion of Matthew 24 that we uh, we can see that the unique commission uh, the master gives to the slave was, was that to make sure the slave would give his household food at the proper time. Uh, not so much make sure the house is clean, make sure the, uh, you know, the, 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 everything you, you, you uh, uh, do every, uh, to take care of all the things around the house well, but to particularly to point out this matter of giving them food at the proper time. Because God, as a God of his economy, he is concerned for his people, for his household to be fed. God's economy, the word economy, uh, which is in, in Greek is oikonomia, uh, referring to God's household administration, his household management. God has a household that he wants his household to be fed, to be nourished, to be supplied so that his household can express him. If God's household is in poverty, is in uh, famine, is starving, what kind of a household is that? God in his economy desires to impart himself into his chosen people so that he may gain a corporate expression. So this charge the master has toward the, to the slaves was to make sure not just they would faithfully carry out the do different duties, do, do, do this, do that, but particularly in the matter of giving food. God wants to be food to his people. Amen. It doesn't matter what area of the service you carry out, whether you go to preach the gospel, you go to uh, uh, shepherd uh, the young people, uh, to go to the campus to preach the gospel, uh, the community knocking on doors, uh, or to just help people to, to understand the Bible, to read the Bible. Whatever we do, we should have this conviction within, I'm there to give them food. Even to preach the gospel to people is to give them food, not just to give them some commandment, give them some order, you know, threatening them, you all, you have to repent, you have to, what, you'll be burning in hell, you know, you have to turn back to God. No, that's not food. That is just uh, to, to frighten people, threaten people. Uh, you, even in your preaching the gospel, you are there to give them food. As Paul says, he would go to, uh, that he, uh, at the, un he, uh, the, he, the unsearchable riches of Christ as the gospel to be, preach to others. What, what we should preach to others is not just the four spiritual laws, not just, just to tell people about what Christ did uh, as, as a, 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 some kind of a great uh, work, accomplishment. So in our carrying out our service, we have to have this inner conviction and realization. I'm there to give people food. God desires that his household would be fed with food at the proper time. This is for the accomplishing of God's economy. This is not just merely doing some work for God, uh, to serve God in that sense. We are here to respond to God's commission in relation to his economy, in his uh, gaining a household, right, uh, which can be supplied and fed and nourished for his expression. 
B says, God has set faithful and prudent slaves over his household as household administrators, stewards, channels of supply to give his people food at the proper time. So <clears throat> if you are, you know, uh, we all are learning to serve, serve the Lord, whether full time or uh, part time or just uh, even as a working saint, we all have a desire to serve the Lord. But what does it mean to serve the Lord? To serve the Lord is to be a steward, to be a, a channel of supply. Right? We want to see all the churches, all the saints, not just, you know, would be, uh, not just to be uh, just attendance of meetings, just faithfully coming to, to attend meetings and not just, uh, uh, you know, here, here and there, uh, helping out in different areas of need in the church uh, businesses uh, matters. But all the saints would have this realization. I, I am here as a believer in the church life to give one another food. I am a steward. Right? I am I'm a channel of supply. I want God to be able to flow through me, right? to flow out of me, to be ministered to others, so that others, after my serving to them, whether it's you are an usher, ushering the saints, come in on the Lord's Day, come, in, come to the meeting, you are there ushering. You are not just ushering people, you know, with a nice smile. You are also supplying people with Christ. That is the most pleasant thing. That is the most honorable thing that you can do to the saints, is to minister Christ. Um, and you play piano, you you make bread, you do all the services with this realization that I'm carrying out my service to feed people food, to minister food, right? Um, you know, the uh, uh, you know years ago, brother even remind us even in cleaning chairs, you know, in a chair arranging such a service in the church, you can be just you know doing that service. Uh, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of routine, uh, outward way, make sure everything is dusted, you know, dusted out well, and then uh, clean well. And but you know, uh, uh, but you can also serve in another way, as you are cleaning and arranging. You pray for everyone who is going to sit on this chair, that when they come to sit on this chair, may they receive Christ. They would receive Christ. They would see Christ then that service, even though not directly ministering to people, even your prayer for, for, the, for these ones who are going to, to receive the benefits of your service, the Lord will be faithful to even to answer, to answer your prayer, that these ones who will be benefited by your service, they will receive the Lord. The Lord will be able to be dispensed into them. C says, give them food. This phrase huh, refers to what? Ministering the Word of God and Christ as the life supply to the believers in the church. What is the food? The food is not, you know, certainly not the, the physical food. The food is not your knowledge. The food is not just some information that you have. The food is uniquely God Himself. God in Christ as the food and, and especially his word. The Lord says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. God's word is food. Of course, people can take God's word merely in the black and white as letters. That is not food. You just go to, you know, meet with your contact and then you read some verses to them, you know, to pass on some knowledge you know, what, this, what these verses mean, that doesn't necessarily, you are feeding food to them. That word has to be food to you first, right? You have to learn to eat the word. That's why the matter of pray reading the word is so important. If you have not eaten the word as food, you will not be able to dispense the word as food to others. So every day, when we, when, you know, every morning we should have our morning revival. You know, we open up the Holy Word for morning revival. Pray, read the Word, right? Not in a routine way, just to 
you know, read it a couple of times, repeat it a couple of times. That does not mean anything, brothers and sisters. I'm just so burdened these days. We are not in the Lord, in the churches, in the Lord's recovery. We are not here just to carry out some kind of routine, local church routine. Uh, we are here to really experience the Lord, enjoy the Lord, touch the Lord in a real way. Even in your personal time with the Lord, right? Your morning revival is every day, every day, to make sure you are exercising the Spirit to, ex to pray, read the Word, to receive the Word as food into you. You may not be able to memorize every word in the ver in the, of the verses you read that morning, but even if one little word in that verse will be received by you as food, as nourishment, that is good enough. Many times, that's what I ask for when I come to the Lord. Lord, give me a word today. Give me a word today. That, that word may be just a, 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 do not love the world. Do not love the world. That's that, that word, maybe the rest of, the, of the, that verse, I don't remember. Do not love the world. That word becomes living. That word becomes supplying, right? That word, even when you speak to others, will be also food to them. So uh, we have to minister the word of God to minister Christ as the life supply to the believers in the church. Christ as the life-giving spirit is our food embodied and realized in the Word of God. So it's not a matter of just how many verses you memorize, how well you can just read to people, you know, the, uh, the printed word, the, uh, you know, you, you, you read to people the, 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 the ministry, the excerpt. But is it food to you, right? You just remember this. It can only be food to others if it is food to you first. If it is just some information to you, be assured, that will also be just information to others. So in order to give food to others, we have to first eat the food, which is Christ as the life-giving spirit embodied in the word. It is the word that is spirit and life that can be nourishing, supplying to people. One says, in order to enjoy the Lord as our spiritual food so that we can feed others, we must pray over and muse on His Word, tasting and enjoying it through careful considerations. I like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a, a verse here in, in Psalm 119, verse 15. I'd like to read to you. It says, I will muse upon your precepts and regard your ways. Uh, and there's a wonderful footnote on the word muse. It says, rich, this word, rich in meaning. The Hebrew word for muse, often translated meditate in the King James Version, implies to worship, to converse with oneself, and to speak aloud. So to muse, actually, is not merely to meditate. To muse, even to speak out loud, to speak to oneself. You know, sometimes I, uh, I was in Boston recently, and then I saw some trainees, you know, walking around, you know, and uh, outside in the yard in the afternoon, they were actually, they were also praying, and they were just not just meditating. They were also musing, communing. Looks like they were talking to someone. But they were not talking to anyone. They're talking to the Lord, right? But, you know, to really muse uh, on the word is better to be a little, to be audible. Audible, not that, so that because God that cannot hear, not that God is deaf, so that you have to speak loudly to Him. You need to be audible to just to invigorate your spirit, to activate your spirit. You're being audible to speak aloud, not so much for God's sake, but for your own sake, right? To speak to oneself, converse with oneself, speak aloud. To muse on the word is to taste and enjoy it through careful consideration. So don't, in musing, you cannot do it quickly. You have to slowly digest, spend time with the Lord. You cannot have a good morning revival 
quickly, you know, in two or three minutes, just like grabbing a cup of coffee and then, and then go, you, that's your breakfast. You know, they will not be a very good breakfast. In order to have a good breakfast, you need at least 15, 20 minutes to sit down to receive the food, digest the food. Same thing spiritually, to muse on the word, to consider carefully the every word that is spoken. Not so much, not so much in the amount, the, the how many words, how many verses you read that morning, but in the quality. As I said, even one word. One time I still remember, I, I still years ago now, I was, uh, before I, I was waiting for a bus in my school, going to school, and I was just pray reading 1 Corinthians 6, 17, you know, he who is joined to the Lord. And I just, as I was praying, I was at least spend 10, 15 minutes just on that verse, pray reading. I was, before I got on the bus, I was nearly beside myself. Just, oh, the, he who is joined to the Lord, joined to the Lord. Oh, I'm joined to the Lord. Oh, that word join, it just leaped out at me. I'm joined to the Lord. I'm one spirit, one spirit. His spirit and my spirit are one spirit. Oh, saints, muse on the word and with careful consideration, right? There's so, the word of God, unlike other uh, publications in the world, is full of nourishment, full of life. But you need to know how to milk it out, how to milk out the word. Right? Get all the riches out. So you need to taste and enjoy it through careful consideration. Prayer, speaking to oneself and praising the Lord may also be included in musing on the word. To muse on the word of God is to enjoy his word as his breath and thus to be infused with God, to breathe God in and to receive spiritual nourishment. Isn't that a rich, rich footnote? Very, 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 very rich. Now, uh, <clears throat> number two, we must devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This is the word of the apostles in Acts chapter 6, while the, after the church in Jerusalem was established, and now there are many things, many affairs, business affairs of the church uh, now needed to be tended to. And the apostles, they realize they should not be distracted. They need to give themselves to what? First, prayer, and to the ministry of the word, especially full-timers serving in the churches. You should not be distracted by many needed things. I need to do that, I need to tend to that. You need to first pray, give yourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Through prayer, you learn to muse on the word, you come to touch God, to taste God, to enjoy God. And out of your musing on his word, your tasting of God, then you will minister this as the word to people, right? This is how we serve. Then D says, to say in, his, in our heart that our master delays is to love the present evil age and not to love the Lord's appearing. This slave, so uh, interesting. He just had this thought in his heart. Oh, the, my master delays. He won't come back so soon. He has not come back for the last 2,000 years. Most likely won't be enough for another, another 100 years. Maybe not in my lifetime. So I have so many things I like to do. And, you know, I don't know how, how, how you saints feel related to the Lord's coming. Do you want to see the Lord come back soon or do you want to see the Lord come back later? You know, when I was uh, younger, you know, on the one hand, you know, when, when the Lord says, you, we, I come quickly and we need to pray also quickly come. But I just, Lord, don't come too quick <laughs> because number one, oh, I'm, I know I'm not, I was not ready. Right? I was not ready. I don't want the Lord to come when I was not ready. And I also, at the same time, I had other things I like to do. I was just, uh, I have my future. I have, uh, you know, other things of the world I had not finished tasting and enjoying. So I had all these desires. So, you know, outwardly, yeah, the Lord could come quickly, but inwardly, not so, not so quick. Not so quick, right? Uh, here's that slave having, having that kind of, uh, in his heart, he says, the Lord delays. 
And just judging from, oh, it, it won't, the law won't be coming back so soon. But I, I, unlike these days, I don't know, you know, looking at these days, you cannot help but realize the Lord is coming soon. You cannot say anymore, the Lord is delaying. He is not delaying. He is actually hastening. He is actually uh, stepping up, speeding up his return. Uh, well, as this slave says in his heart, that my master delays, then what happened? This is an indication that he has some love to the present evil age, and he does not love the Lord's appearing. You know, the, uh, um, in 2 Timothy 4, you know, Paul says, uh, the Lord will reward those who loves his appearing. We need to have this kind of sensation. I hope through this conference, in these two meetings here this weekend, the Lord can stir up in us a proper sensation for the Lord's coming. Sister Emmy Barber was one who always longed, loved the Lord's appearing. She always wondered, how come so long the Lord still has not come back? One time she was walking with Brother Nee just down the street. And she, it was, I think it was like the last day of the, a, a new year, a, a last day of the year. And she t- asked, you know, Brother uh, Ni, nee, how come this year is about to end? The Lord still has not come back. And then maybe they were about to turn the corner. Maybe when we turn the corner, maybe we, can, we will see him. She was in this kind of a longing, in this kind of a love for the Lord, longing to see the Lord's face. It's totally opposite from what this slave said in his heart. It means a lot, brothers and sisters, to express to the Lord every day, Lord, come quickly. If we express this to the Lord, express this having this kind of sensation, having this kind of love, your daily life will not be the same. You know, if you have this kind of a love every day, you know, you, you know the Lord may, may come as you drive off the, 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 the car, drive off the driveway. You may, the Lord may, may, may come back. We don't know. But if you have that kind of sensation, will you dare to, be, to still love the world? Will you still dare, to, dare to, to say things, do things the way you naturally do? You have to see him. You have to give account to him how you conduct yourself. So our, our love for the Lord's appearing is important. I hope even just really th- th- through these messages, the Lord can rekindle our love, not just for the Lord, but also for his appearing, for him to appear. One says, we must beware of covetousness not storing up treasure for ourselves, but being rich toward God. Uh, you know, in Luke 12, there is this uh, parable of a rich man who has stored up a lot of riches. And then he was even planning, oh, I would like to big, build bigger, bigger storehouse, bigger silo. I have all these... Uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the produce I collected, all these things, I need to have bigger storage, then I'm all set, I can retire early, and I can uh, do more things. You know, now, to these days, you know, uh, many, many uh, young, young people in their 20s and not even 30, they, they you know, they, they, they found a niche in today's uh, uh, tech field, and then they can make the over, overnight millionaire. And, uh, you know, they, 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 now they can buy big houses, driving uh, uh, Tesla, di- driving the most advanced cars, and enjoy the top, the best kind of food. And then now I want a big, kind of, even a bigger house. Uh, four bedroom, not enough. I want to have a seven bedroom house. And I want to have a, not just a, a, a Tesla, maybe something even better, you know. Uh, you know, just something more, bigger silo, bigger, bigger storehouses. Then, then what's, what did it say in, the, in those verses? It says, the Lord says to that man, he said, tonight I will, I, will, uh, I will take your soul. That means you'll die. Tonight your soul will be gone. After your soul is taken away, 
Whose, whose are these things? Who will th these things belong to? These things are not going to go with you. You collected so much. These things will become actually your condemnation. How you did not love the Lord's appearing. Instead, you love all these earthly possessions. So you are not rich toward God. I really was touched by these three words. Are we rich toward God? You may be rich in the world today, rich before man's eyes, but are we rich toward God? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 10, this says that although he appeared to be poor, but he made many rich. Outwardly, we may be the poor people. We, we, we don't have much materially, but yet we have the richest one within us. We have the, the one who owns the thousand hills, who owns all the cattle, all the, all the lands, uh, the whole universe. This one is not only in me, he is, I'm one with him. He is one with me. I'm enjoying him. He is, he is enjoying me. He is in me and I'm in him. I'm here to make many people rich by ministering this rich Christ to people. Outwardly, we may be poor, but inwardly, before God, we are rich because we have the rich Christ in us. To be prepared these days for the Lord's coming, we need to have a different scale of measurement. You know, different uh, um, how you measure your wealth, right? You don't measure your wealth by dollars and cents. How you, you have to measure your wealth by how rich you are toward God. This is a real measurement. When God, when, when, uh, uh, when he appears, when we have to stand before him, the Lord is not going to ask you, well, how much accomplishment you made? What is the highest degree you attained to? Uh, what uh, project you have completed? What is, your, what is the total net worth you have? Forget about that. All those things mean nothing. The Lord is going to ask you how much you have allowed Christ to make his home in you. How much Christ do you have? You are saved, no doubt, but you have just a little bit of Christ. You, your, your spiritual worth, your, your spiritual net worth is very little. Maybe not zero, but it's only $10, right? You may be a multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire, but your spiritual net worth is only a few dollars. That will not be good, right? As you can see in these days, in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this, uh, 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 you know, vain world, uh, this uh, decaying world, everything just uh, is vanity but vanity, right? Uh, sometime, when, some time ago when I saw some uh, videos about, uh, you know, tsunami, one time it hit Japan, and I saw these uh, cars, you know, whether it doesn't matter it's Toyotas or Lexus, it doesn't matter. When, when that, to, 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 uh, that tsunami came, it swept those cars like toys, just, you know, just all the houses. It doesn't matter you are just a two-bedroom apartment or it's a 10-bedroom mansion. When that tsunami came, it makes no difference. All swept away. What is your worth? What is your real net worth? Are you rich toward God? Number two says, remember Lot's wife. It's a solemn warning to the world-loving believers. You know the story of Lot, Lot's wife. God came to rescue Lot out of Sodom, and his wife came along also. While Lot made it to the other side, right? He was, they both left. They both were delivered, uh, escaped Sodom. While, while, Lot made it all the way to the other side. His wife still lingered uh, of her possession, of her, or, or her, her uh, uh, the, 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 the days of, uh, of her enjoyment and pleasure he, she had back in Sodom. She looked back, and right away she became a pillar of salt. 
Salt is not for making a pillar. Salt is for salting food, to give taste, to preserve. But now this salt became a pillar. With this person who lingered, uh, linger after the things that she was enjoying in the world. So here's a, a, a verse telling us we need to remember, remember Lot's wife. Here is a p- person escaping God's judgment. In one sense, she did escape. She was spared from perdition. She was delivered from God's judgment, but not all the way. She's not under God's condemnation, but she did not make it all the way to the kingdom either. She was in the middle, midway, and became a useless pillar of salt. Number three says, we must be watchful and beseeching so that the day of the Lord's coming will not come upon us suddenly as a snare. I don't believe that when the Lord comes back, he is going to make an announcement. Okay, my people, I will come back tomorrow, uh, such and such a time. Be ready to meet me. I don't think it will not be like that. As the Lord even says, at a time that you don't know of, at a time that you are not aware of, he appears. So we need to be prepared all the time. not to be caught uh, that by the Lord's sudden appearing. Now, point E, to beat our fellow slaves is to mistreat fellow believers. So interesting. I was wondering, why in the world this, uh, this uh, slave, as soon as she had, he, had, he had the thought that the Lord delays, that, uh, you know, he, uh, 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 you know, he, he started beating the fellow slaves. You know, uh, you know realize, I just realized that uh, uh, to serve the Lord is not an individual matter. Here are many slaves serving together, serving together. And here's a, a situation the Lord exposed that this slave, not only still loving the present world, but also he mistreated his fellow slaves. Dear brothers and sisters, now today in the church life, in the body, we learn to serve together. We have many fellow slaves. <clears throat> you don't just serve the Lord alone by yourself. We are not individual, uh, uh, isolated <clears throat> servants of the Lord. We are serving with other fellow slaves. Then, but the test is, <clears throat> the test is, how do you treat your fellow slaves? And this slave, you know, taking the excuse of the Lord's delay coming <clears throat> to not only love the world, but also to mistreat fellow slaves. I feel this is so, so meaningful in relation to our service. What is our view toward the ones whom we serve with? You have to take care of your fellow servants serving the Lord together. Number one says, we must not judge and condemn our fellow believers, but be kind to them, tenderhearted, forgiving them, even as God in Christ forgave us. Do you believe that Christians or servants of God would mistreat fellow slaves, fellow servants of God? This is, this is not just an empty word in the Bible. This happens so many often, even in our own serving life. Even you consider your serving life in the church. When you come together, maybe four or five of you serving in the children's meetings, serving young people or, or, or the college students. And then, you know, as you are praying, coordinating together, some said this, oh, we should do this, do this with, the, uh, with the young people. You said, oh, that, what a stupid idea that is. You know, I have heard saints even use the word stupid to, to rev- it is a reviling word. 
because just because someone is not as smart as you are, not as quick as you are, not as experienced as you are, then you say, it's so stupid for you to say this. I have been doing this for, I know exactly what needs to be done. I, need, I, I know how to, how to say this. I know how to do this. You pass on your criticism. You pass on your judgment. You forget that as you are a servant to the, to the Lord as the master, he is also a servant answering to the master. Who are you? This kind of mistreatment, sorry to say, still goes on even among saints, serving ones in the church. Criticisms, condemnation, judgment. The Lord wants us to, to serve Him together as a priesthood, to be built up as a corporate priesthood. Not just that you, you are doing a good job, you are, you, you are, you are so faithful, you, that's enough. The Lord wants to see a corporate priesthood built up in one accord. Your loose words, your critical words of criticizing others, uh, to condemn others, judging others, will cause you to be judged by the Lord. Instead, we should be kind to others, tender-hearted. Ephesians 4, verse 3 tells us what? That uh, we have to, to, with all tender-heartedness, we have to, with all long-suffering, lowliness, bearing one another in love. Yes, you may be more advanced in your service, in your knowledge, in your gifts, and your, the others are not as good as you are, but you, you are being put together to be built up together. How do you learn to bear one another in love? Be kind to one another. What the Lord will look at is not how efficient is your service, but really how much you exercise kindness, tenderheartedness with one another so that your service is a coordinated, built up service in one accord. So, in this example, in this parable, the Lord brought out this matter of beating the fellow slaves. Number two says, we must not revile or criticize our brothers, but consider them more excellent than, themse- than ourselves. I hope the Lord will really uh, uh, bring us into this kind of a, a spirit as we serve the Lord in the church life. Considering others better than yourself, right? Don't be so quick to pass on judgment, pass on criticism, the reviling. Even revilers, the Lord says, if you, are, if you keep on living a life of reviling, always reviling people, you have no share, no part in the kingdom of God. It's a serious thing. We must not lord it over our fellow believers, but serve them as a slave. Uh, Well, let me just back up one one bit. You know, what is reviling? You look up in the dictionary. The reviling means what? Speak uh, uh, contemptuous words. Uh, uh, To to have a a kind of... you know, careless, uh, kind of uh, contemptuous, uh, uh, looking down at others. Those are, that's what I mean, reviling. Just, uh, 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 you know, downgrading people, criticizing people. That's reviling. It's a serious thing. Then the next point, talk about not lording over others, but serve them as slaves to feed them with the resurrected Christ as the life-giving spirit. That's what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5. Even elders who are supposed to be the leaders of the church, they should not lord it just because they have that position as an elder in the church. That does not make them a lord, the one who controls the saints, telling the saints what to do, where to go, what to wear. We like to 
there is a tendency, not only for the slaves or the servants of the Lord, not only to criticize others who are inferior, who are not so, not so good, but also to exercise control, directing others. Don't forget, the Lord is their Lord, right? You, who, who are you to tell them? They are not serving you. You are his, you are, we are fellow slaves to one another. If he is wrong or he or she is wrong, let the Lord check them, right? But we learn not to lord over others in our service. Now, point F, to eat and drink with the drunken is to keep company with worldly people who are drunk with worldly things. Because of their divine nature and holy standing, the believers should not be yoked together with the unbelievers. This should be applied to all intimate relationships between believers and unbelievers, not only to marriage and business. Be careful whom you associate with. It doesn't mean that we do not have friends in the world. Surely we have friends in the world. Otherwise, who are you going to preach the gospel to, right? If we just, uh, you know, chase away the, uh, the, the people in the world. That does, but be careful how you befriend them. We do not become drinkers and eaters and drinkers. With, get drunken with them. Get indulged, carried away with them. You know, in the, in the bar, in the, in, the, in the entertainment. It's one thing to have you know, to befriend them so that, you know, at a certain point, the Lord may use you to preach the gospel to, 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 the, to them. But it's another thing to become involved with them, uh, to entertain with them, to be carried away by the things of the world. To, to befriend the world is, is, uh, is, is hateful in God's eyes. So on the one hand, we have people in the world um, as our friend, to, to, you know, we can remember them, bring them to the Lord. But on the other hand, we don't have friends. We don't have friends in the sense of we don't have that kind of an association with them, to get involved with them, to be drawn away by, with them. And, you know, it mentioned talk, talk about marriage. You know, we have the words in 2 Corinthians 6, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the believers with unbelievers, they don't, they don't match, right? We are not compatible. And also even in, in, in doing business, uh, and there's a lot of involvement there. And you, if you enter into business venture with uh, unbelievers, there'll be a lot of uh, 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 difficulties, complications that may, you may not be easy to get out. And you yourself will be drawn in or be distracted. So we have to be careful about our, our relationship with the world. How, then, number two, we must flee youthful lust and pursue the all-inclusive Christ with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The best thing is to be, have vital companions in the church life to pursue the Lord with, right? To love the Lord with, to serve, to serve the Lord with, you know, is... If you are always associating with the people in the world, sooner or later, you'll be drawn away. This is, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a matter of time. So the best thing is for you to be protected, just to have the proper companions in the Lord to pursue the Lord with. Now we come to the second section, Matthew 25. Verses 14 to 30 reveals that we must be faithful in service in the Lord's gift to make a profit for Him, that we may enter into the joy of the Lord in the coming kingdom. I think this portion uh, of Matthew 24 is more familiar to many of us through the years about the Master giving upon His uh, departure to a long journey. He gave, uh, he gave uh, possession to his slaves. One gave, he gave five talent, and another he gave two talents, another one, one talent. And the one, and the one who had five went out to do business and gained another five. And then the one who, did, who had two also did likewise and gained another two talent. But the one who received one talent, he instead, he was afraid and he buried his one talent because he was afraid that he does not know how to do business, he may lose it. And just to be on the safe side, he just buried it. 
And this one was rebuked by the Lord. He was not using the Lord's gift to them uh, properly, fully. Now, Asas, the Lord likened himself to a man going abroad into the heavens and delivering to his slaves his possessions. His possession signifies the church with all the believers who constitute God's household. So here it says that this master delivered to his slaves his possessions. What are his possessions? We, God, God says that his people, his people are his personal possession. We are his personal treasure. We are his personal possession. So this includes all his, uh, uh, all the saints, all the believers uh, in the church. They are God's possession. And God gave these possessions to the slaves. So who, am, who, who are these uh, 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 slaves? Whom should they be serving? They are taking care of these possessions. God has given you the church. God has given you the, the believers. Even in general, you may say, even the whole mankind. They are God's possession. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They are God's creatures, and God gave us His possessions. All that belonged to Him, He gave us, gave them to the, to the, to the slaves for us to, to take care of. Then B says, to one of his slaves he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Number one says, talent signifies spiritual gifts, spiritual skills, and abilities. Talents. So these are, one was given five talents. One was given two. One was given one. Out of his possessions. So there's one, there's one thing to, to see what the, we have the Lord's possessions. That's all that belong to the Lord. And there's some, another thing called talents. These are the Lord's gifts. Saints, to serve the Lord, we need some talents. We need gifts. These are the spiritual ability. Not only the full-timers need to be gifted. Every saint who serves in the church is a gifted one. God has given each and every one of us some talent, at least one. No one can say, I have not received anything. God has, out of His possessions, He has given us talents, at least one talent, to serve Him with. You cannot say, I don't know how to serve the Lord. I have not been to full-time training. I have not been uh, uh, in, in the church that long. As long as you are a saved one, even for one week, you have a talent. Amen. The Holy Spirit in you is your talent, giving you the ability. This, to serve the Lord, needs talent. You cannot serve the Lord by your natural, by your natural skills. Maybe, you know, you have gone to Harvard MBA school, business school, got your MBA, you are a top, you are a smart, capable, you know, manager, administrator. You think that, oh, now I'm qualified to serve in the church. I can help to manage the church here. I, would, I have an MBA from Harvard. You will ruin the church. You will, you will, you will, you will just uh, uh, corrupt the church. The church does not need your natural skills. The church needs the spiritual talents, the gifts. And these gifts, you know, in, uh, you know according to uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, um, verse 6 says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Gifts differ according to the grace given to us. Meaning what? What is grace? Grace is God enjoyed by us. The more you enjoy grace, the greater will be your gifts. If you want to be gifted to serve the Lord, enjoy the Lord more. Enjoy to experience Him as grace. The gifts are given according to the grace. If you have no enjoyment, no experience of Christ as grace, you don't have much gift to give, to exercise with. Then, <clears throat> a, uh, 
A sister verse to this is in Ephesians chapter 4. I think it's verse 7. Yeah, verse 7. It says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. According to this verse, that it says that grace is given according to the gift, or to the measure of the gift of Christ. So what does that mean? Is grace... Is the, is the gift given according to the grace or grace given according to the gift? There are these two sides. On the one hand, if, in order for us to, to build up our spiritual ability, the gift, we need to enjoy grace. The more grace you receive, the more ability you will build up. But then on the other side, you need to have certain gift. And also, grace will be given according to the gift. It can be uh, like measure of the gift. It can be likened to a body. The amount of blood that flows to my little finger compares to the amount of blood flowing to my shoulder or to my thigh varies. Because I have a, you know, my, my thigh is, uh, is the strongest, biggest muscle there. It requires a lot of blood supply to go there. And my little finger it's a member, but it's, uh, the capacity is not that great. Only small, uh, the small amount of blood goes there. So the grace will be given according to the measure of the gift. So how, how, whether you are a thigh or you are a little finger, the grace gives to you according to that. But then the more you exercise this gift, more grace will be given to you. Right? And the more grace you give in, the more grace you enjoy, you can become a bigger gift, a bigger, a, a, a gift with larger capacity. Okay, I think that's good enough. Now, talents signify spiritual gifts, spiritual skills and abilities. To all the members of the body of Christ are gifted, and all are gifts. Amen? Amen? Every member, we have to believe, brothers and sisters, every single one, young and old, newly saved or been saved for a long time, you, as long as you are a, a believer, you are a member of the body of Christ, you are gifted. You have a talent. There's no one who has zero talent. You may not be five talented. You may not be two talented, but you are at least a one talented member. We all are gifts. Number three says, own ability. This phrase, these two words, signifies our natural ability, which is constituted of God's creation and our learning. Yes, there is that consideration. The Apostle Paul, when he was, uh, uh, you know, Saul of Tarsus, surely he had a greater, greater capacity. His ability was greater than Peter, right? Even Peter acknowledged the, the things that Paul spoke is hard to understand. He had a greater capacity, even in human learning. He went to, he was trained under Gamaliel and so on and so forth. But then with that, with that, but God cannot use his natural ability as it was. Those natural ability has to be brought to God's grace to, to become the proper gift to be used for the body. Trading with talent signifies using the gift of the Lord has given to us. We need to be all traders. Trading means to exercise, to use. You know, some have done some selling or, or purchasing. You know, trading always involves a risk. You know, you, you sell something, you don't know there will be buyers or not. You, you sell something, you don't know whether they will give you the price you want. You may be at a loss. Some of you may get a gain. You don't know. But if you don't trade, if you don't make an attempt, you will never know. That's why, you know, the, well, here's the point that we need to, the, the Lord has given you gifts. What are you going to do with it? You have to use it. Don't ignore it. Don't bury it. You have to use the gift. Yes, there is some risk involved, but you have to trade it so that it can be useful, multiply Gaining other talents signifies the gift that we receive from the Lord has been used to the fullest extent without any loss or waste. We want to use the, 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 the that means uh, the, the five talented one gained another five. That means he used the gift to the fullest. He gained 100%. And the two, the same thing. 
The two did not gain five. He, the two only gained two. But, the, but the, the praise, the appreciation by the master to both slaves were the same. No different. Just because he gained, one, one gained five, he got a higher praise. No. The Lord wants to see each one of us. Doesn't matter if you have five, two, or one talent. You must exercise your gift to the fullest. Amen. Then you get the same reward. Now see, the one talented one went off, dug in the earth, and hid his master's money. The earth signifies the world. Thus, dug in the earth signifies becoming involved in the world to bury the gifts we have received from the Lord. Hit his master's money signifies rendering the Lord's gift useless, letting it lie waste under the cloak of certain earthly excuses to make any excuse for not using the Lord's gift to hide the gift. I was touched that this slave, he was afraid. He was not as smart as the five talented one or the two talented one. He was afraid he had no experience in trading. So the best thing is not to do anything. Otherwise, he will lose even the capital. So, but it's not only that. Not only that he did not use it. He even buried it. He dug into the earth and buried it. He did something. He did the wrong thing. He, did, he, he dug the earth. Instead of putting the money to use, he buried the money under the earth. And the earth signifies all the worldly involvement. This aims for our preparation of the Lord's re return. Living in today's, this, uh, this uh, uh, world, complicated, supposedly very advanced, very, uh, you know, uh, age, technological advanced age, with all the facilities and all the conveniences, it's so easy for today's young people to bury their talent in the earth. If you want to do something, any you can you can you can do you can you can make a you can make a success, but it would cost you to dig some earth, get involved. But in the meantime, you bury the talent. You bury the talent, and you would render yourself useless to God. You are not faithful to the gift that God has given to you. You want to give yourself, you want to be the next uh, Bill Gates, you want to be the next, uh, next uh, Elon Musk, whatever. You know, you want to make your next billion. You have to dig some earth. You will not be able to pursue the Lord. You will not be able to, you know, be in the church life, be built up with the saints. Because you need to be involved. That earth, that earth will, will envelop you. And then your, your talent will be buried. You will not be able to, you know, to uh, uh, minister food to others, to build up the church. So in the meantime, you become useless. The one talent that you have been given, when the Lord comes back, you give him back the same thing. That's why the Lord came back. He was angry. He was upset with that one talent. You are an evil, you are a slothful and evil slave. He should have done something with that one talent, even in a minimal way. Do some investment, very safe investment. But instead, you duck into the earth. You did something improperly. Get involved with the earth and causing my talent to be buried there. So the Lord rebuked that slave. Nandi says, in the coming kingdom, the Lord's gift will be taken away from the slothful believers and they will be cast into the outer darkness, but the faithful believer's gift will be increased and they will enter into the outer, uttermost enjoyment of Christ. The one, the one talent will be even taken away from him and given to, to the one who has already 10 talents. You say, well, that's not fair. He has already 10. You know, that one only has one. Share the wealth, you know, to spread the wealth. No, that's not how God looks at it. The more you are faithful, the you to invest, to use your talent, the more will be given to you in the next age, in the age of the kingdom. The less you exercise, you are passive, you are not faithful to what the Lord has given to you. Even that little bit you have will be taken away from you. And you'll be sent to the outer darkness 
to be disciplined. Now, uh, let me finish with the last point. I just read to you Roman numeral three. All the problems in the church today issue from the one talented ones. The Lord has shown us that there is not one whose gift exceeds five talents. For a span of 20 years, the church may have only one with five talents, like Brother Watchman Nee, Brother Witness Lee. We, can, we have to acknowledge these are five talented members. But every day, the church can have five persons, each with one talent. A five talented member don't come around that easily. 20 years, maybe even more, maybe even longer. But every day, we can have one talent. Every, you know, in, in the church life, any one of the, of, the, of the children of God, even the one in the poorest condition, listen, still has one, condi- one talent. Even in the poorest condition, the weakest condition, he still has one talent. And when you put five of these one talent ones together, it equals one who has five talents. If all the one talented ones in the church today would bring forth their talents, there will be no need of so many gift, great gifts among us. Just by, the, just by the coming forth of the one talented ones, let me tell you, the whole world will be conquered. Do you believe this, brothers and sisters? I believe this. Today is not the age of the spiritual giants. That age is over. Today is the age of all the one talented members rising up to function. We should encourage not only ourselves to function, but even all the ones around us. Cultivate, allow, encouraging all the one talented ones to to function. Then there will be many five talented members, functions, all everywhere. The world will be conquered. Today, You may say, we are not short of Christians in the world, but we are short of one talented members using their function in the world. Everyone only looking at the two talented or five talented ones, very few of them. But one talented ones are everywhere, but mostly are just burying their talent. So the Lord has to wake us up, even for the preparation uh, uh, for His coming. We need to be faithful to his commission to us to give people food. And also we need to be faithful to exercise the one talent that he has given to us. And also to even encourage, help the other one talented ones to function. Amen. Okay, I stop here. I finish.